Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt. My name is Bodie, and I am your host, and I am recording on Sunday, the 14th of November, because I have a little cold. And on Friday, I was like, man, I'm really tired for some reason. I'll just record on Saturday. And on Saturday, I felt like absolute uh, garbage. So I pretty much slept most of Saturday. So there you go. That, that, that brings us to today. But I feel much better today, so that's good. And it's not COVID because I took a COVID test and it's negative. And I've also been vaccinated and boosted, so it's definitely not COVID. Anyway, having said all that, let's go ahead and jump into our news. We talked a few weeks ago about Lordstown Motors possibly selling their plant in Lordstown, Ohio to Foxconn. Foxconn makes you know, products for like Apple and a bunch of other electronics uh, companies. Foxconn will also be building the Fisker Ocean for Fisker, then really cool looking, I don't know, I would call it a Model Y competitor. But back to the point of the story, Foxconn will be purchasing the Lordstown plant from Lordstown Motors. And then in turn, not only will it be worth, it was, I think it was worth like something like $250 million purchase, but Foxconn will also help uh, participate in the design and development of the Lordstown Endurance electric pickup truck. So kind of a win-win for both companies because I don't think Lordstown was going to get that done on their own. They're kind of floundering here at the moment. Speaking of floundering, Nikola Motors has agreed to pay a $125 million penalty to the SEC due to the former founder and CEO, Trevor Milton, uh, misleading investors. So we've talked about this over the last couple of months. I'm not going to go into it again. Milton is under indictment for three counts of fraud. Nikola will seek reimbursement from Milton to cover the costs and damages related to the investigation and penalties. And if you don't think Milton can afford it, he literally got billions from this deal. So he'll probably be okay, even if he does have to pay them back. Hyundai Motor Group will begin manufacturing the Genesis GV70 EV. It's a lot of, lot of letters in there. In 2022, if you're not aware of the Genesis brand, this is Hyundai's luxury brand. They, they look really nice. Sometimes if you see a Genesis from far away and it's kind of coming at you, you might think that it might be a Bentley or something like that. That's how nicely designed these vehicles are. I don't have any specs for the GV70 electric vehicle, but you can go to Genesis website and you can look at their ice version of that car. And it looks really nice. Like it looks like a very nice car. So the GV70 EV might be a, an option for those out there looking for a luxury vehicle without the price <laughs> of a luxury vehicle. I mentioned Apple earlier. Apple has hired the former Tesla autopilot software director for Apple's own EV efforts. Christopher C.J. Moore will help Apple realize their EV dreams, whatever that ends up looking like. And I say that because the rumors have like spanned the spectrum of Apple buying a luxury brand like BMW or Mercedes, and then also partnering with a more economic brand, but still a good brand like Kia. And now we're hearing maybe that Apple just build their own car. So who knows? One thing we do know is that Moore left Tesla because he felt that Elon was not accurately describing FSD's capabilities and then also shortcomings. So it'll be interesting to see what he does over there at Apple. Cadillac is getting super serious. I don't know why I said it like that about electrification. Cadillac is pruning 40% of dealerships to help ease their transition to EVs. And I know what you're thinking is you're like, wait, they're pruning 40%. They're cutting away 40% of their dealerships. How does this help their transition to EVs? So right now there are 920 dealerships. They'll decrease that number to 560. Cadillac spent more than $274 million buying out those dealerships that are not willing or able to invest two to five hundred thousand dollars per per store for training and equipment needs to support EVs. So Cadillac's very serious about that. Cadillac will also open showrooms in major cities, much in the same way that Tesla, Lucid, Neo, and other EV manufacturers have. So that's pretty cool. Here's a fun story. If you live in the United States, the U.S. Congress has passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. So know what you're thinking. EV tax credits are on the way. You're going to run out. You're going to find that Cadillac Lyric in 2022, and you are going to purchase it. And you're going to get a nice, big, fat tax credit. Well, not so 
fast. The EV tax credits are not found in the infrastructure bill. Those are found in the Build Back Better bill, which has not yet been passed. There is $7.5 billion in the infrastructure bill to help build out EVs and EV charging infra infrastructure. There's $2.5 billion for zero emission buses, $2.5 billion for low emission buses, and there's $65 billion that will go toward clean energy and hardening our antiquated electrical grid. So pretty good news for the United States. This was a bipartisan bill and I'm really happy that it passed. Let's jump to some battery tech here. North Volt, a company that makes batteries, they have produced the world's first 100% recycled nickel, manganese, and cobalt battery cell, which on the surface of it is actually really cool news. There's just not enough batteries out there that need to be recycled at this point because we're still in the infancy of EVs and battery demand, like new battery cell demand, is just too high. North Volt does plan to produce cells made with 50% recycled materials by 2030. So that kind of gives you an idea of where they're at in terms of their timeline. North Volt is also building a battery recycling plant in Sweden, and they hope to recycle 125,000 tons, not pounds, but tons of batteries per year. They would take that recycled material and turn that into 30 gigawatt hours of new battery cells per year, which is pretty cool. Staying on topic of battery technology, Brown University and the University of Maryland has developed a new battery technology. I got this article from Brown's website. Actually, I got it from a third party website that linked me to Brown's website. And honestly, there wasn't a lot of information up there. So here's what I learned. The new technology would replace some or all of the liquids in lithium ion batteries with solid materials derived from wood. Current batteries use a solution of lithium salt that is dissolved in a liquid organic solvent. This is the electrolyte. The electrolyte then flows through the cathode and anode as the battery is charged and discharged. This works pretty well, but there's some downsides. These types of batteries can develop little lithium dendrites, and we've talked about this before, but dendrites are formed when extra lithium collects on the anode side and isn't absorbed into the solution over time. So what can happen is as these dendrites form on the anode side, they can cause little short circuits or possibly even a catastrophic, fa catastrophic failure, and that would cause a fire. So if you remember a few years ago in 2016, uh, to be specific, when the Galaxy Note 7 would randomly catch fire, well, it turns out that was a dendrite problem. So this new technology developed by Brown and the University of Maryland is an advancement in that solid state battery technology that we've been talking about for the last five years on this show. The researchers have developed this solid ion conductor that combines the copper and the cellulose nanofibrils. And these are like little polymer tubes that are derived from wood. Just kind of an editorial note, that last sentence was filled with words that I don't quite understand, like nanofibrils and, you know, researchers. Anyway, the material is as thin as a piece of paper, but it is 10 to 100 times better than the polymer ion conductors that are currently used in lithium ion batteries, according to researchers. And that's quite of a range of improvement, 10 to 100 times better. It seems like maybe they haven't got that quite ironed out yet, or maybe in certain situations it's 10 times better, in other situations it's 100 times better. Like I said, the article didn't have a ton of information. But the bigger point that I'm trying to make here, and I'm kind of failing at this, so let's try to wrap this up. <laughs> um, the new technology should not only create a battery with more efficiency gains, but it should also prevent dendrites, will, which will make them safer. And that's really the big takeaway from this story. All right, everybody, that is our EV roundup for this week. We're going to get to our Tesla news here in just a second. But first, I would like to invite you to become a member of our Patreon 100% of the money that you pledge on Patreon goes right back into this show. None of the money that you give actually goes towards my personal expenses. All of that goes to pay for this show. And I could give you a rundown of what it actually costs to run the show, but that would take too much time. And that's something I usually do at the end of the year for our patrons. So if you want to know this information and get the inside scoop, and you also don't want to listen to ads when you hear this podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash kilowatt or support kilowatt.com. All right, let's jump into our Tesla news here. 
Tesla is opening a new factory in Canada. And to be more specific, this is in Markham, Canada. The fact, I hope I said that right. The factory will build equipment that will allow Tesla to build 4680 battery cells and battery packs, which is pretty cool. Tesla has also aqua hired a company that I don't quite know how to say their name. I think it's S. You know what? I'm just going to spell it. It's capital S, lowercase i, capital I, capital L, I O N. That is the, the last time that you're going to hear me even try to mention this company's name. But it sounds like the reason for this aqua hire was because this company is working on a high energy density battery, battery chemistry based on a high loaded silicon anode. So if you're not sure what that means, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you're alone here. I, I will read from the article in what was quoted from, I think this was their website. Okay. Company I can't pronounce developer of an advanced lithium ion battery design to address the market's accelerated demand for higher performance energy storage devices. The company's technology delivers high energy batteries by simultaneously incorporating high loaded silicon anodes, nickel rich in MC cathodes and non flammable ionic liquid electrolytes and offer an increase in both energy density and specific energy in lithium ion batteries enabling users to get safer and lower cost energy storage devices for defense, consumer electronics, and electronic, or excuse me, electric vehicle applications. Ah, I mean, that kind of does clear some things up. I still don't quite understand how they're doing this, but what I care about is low cost and safer and more energy density. I care about those three things more than anything else. According to documents, Elon, or an LLC operated on Elon's behalf, has purchased some land in and around Giga, Texas. Horse Ranch LLC actually purchased somewhere between 300 and 620 acres of land. We don't really have a, a, a strong number, which it was. We know it's at least 300, but it could be as much as 620. The Musk family office manager is listed on the LLC. Just from the article that I read, there's a pretty loose connection to Elon. So we don't now actually know if this is Elon for sure. The The headline is Elon purchases this land, but in all honesty, none of the documentation has his name on it as best as I can tell. But if Elon did purchase this land, what is he going to use it for? More land to expand the Tesla site? Maybe. Or maybe some sort of headquarters where Elon will lease the property back to Tesla and make some extra money that way. Or maybe it's a property for another Musk business that has been announced, or maybe it hasn't been announced at all. Maybe Elon's going to build a huge estate on this property um, or possibly develop the property and lease it back to Tesla suppliers. As Giga Texas starts producing cars, they're going to need you know, other companies around Giga Texas to actually support them and bring them in supplies and that kind of thing. So maybe that's, that's what they're doing. Who knows? Or possibly Elon's going to turn it into a Rockefeller style park for the community. I believe he mentioned this at the shareholders meeting that Tesla was thinking about doing something like this, or Tesla would do something similar to this, or it's a combination of some of these things, all of these things, or none of these things. In any case, I'm sure whatever the real reason will surface sooner than later. And we'll keep an eye on it for sure. Tesla's reached a pretty big milestone. They now have over 30,000 fast chargers around the world. That does not include all of their charging stations, just the fast ones. And they probably need to triple that number, <laughs> to be honest. But still, 30,000 is pretty good. And as long as we're talking about Tesla superchargers, let's talk about the mega charger. Tesla has started installing the mega chargers needed to charge the Tesla Semi at Giga Nevada. While speaking to CNBC's Jim Cramer, Pepsi's CEO, Ramon LaGuarda, mentioned that Pepsi would start getting its first Tesla Semis by the end of Q4. That's this Q4. Like, is anybody else shocked on this? I, I am. So, which would mean that Tesla's going to start delivering these to Pepsi somewhere between now and in the end of the year. So I have a clip here. We can listen to the clip. Here's what I want to know. You have your own truck network. You have your own uh, delivery system. What are you going to do to be able to cut the emissions from that? Because it's a great asset, 
but it also generates diesel uh, fumes. Would you be buying a Rivian product? Would you be buying somebody's trucks that uh, use hydrogen? What's your plan? Yeah, it's good, uh, uh, Jim. Actually, transportation is about 10% of our overall gas emissions, so it's important. Uh, and we, we're, we're working on different solutions. Uh, as you think about, you know, we replace our fleet regularly every 10 years, more or less. That's the life of a truck. And we're already starting to uh, buy uh, electric uh, trucks, actually, from Tesla. I mean, I don't want to promote anybody, but that's the brand we're using so far. And we're getting our first delivery is this Q4. So it's something we started a few years ago. We're working with Tesla. But clearly, to, to make this pivot, which is late in our journey, uh, because we think this technology is now too expensive. We, we hope it's going to go down, and we're working on that to go down. To make this transition, I need clean energy. I need clean energy no matter, you know, even, even if the cars are electric, still they're going to be very polluting if we don't change the grid to clean energy. So I need, the, what I was saying earlier, I need policymakers to help us pivot our uh, electric grid to uh, clean electric grid so that electric vehicles can be zero pollutants. But that's, that's the journey for us, and you're right. Uh, trucks is a big is a big component. Uh, Ten percent of our gas emissions, and we're it's, it's a big pillar of our of our transformation. I want to follow up there. I, I didn't know your deal with Tesla. Can you kind of flush it through? Tesla's down very badly because of a, a tax bill, and it might be an opportunity. I didn't know that you had this good relationship with Tesla. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working with different uh, providers in different parts of the world. Tesla is, is a, uh, obviously a, um, a, you know, a, an innovator, uh, and they're, they're, they're innovating together with us in solutions that work for our particular needs of our tracks. So, yes, they are, they are a partner of ours for that, this particular solution. So you can see the full clip over at patreon.com forward slash kilowatt. I've put that up there for you. One of the things that I thought was interesting is Pepsi, PepsiCo, so all of the brands underneath PepsiCo, their commitment to you know renewable energy and and reducing their carbon footprint. Because honestly, if you would ask me what are PepsiCo's you know thoughts on reducing their carbon footprint, I would say, well, it's probably much like any other company. They want to do it so that they can say that they did it, but I don't think they could really care that much. It really does seem like the CEO, Ramon LaGuarda. It seems like he really does care. So if you want to see that full clip, go to patreon.com forward slash kilowatt. It's the first post. But as far as these comments of, you know, getting the Tesla semis by the end of Q4, somebody reached out to Elon on Twitter and Elon's response back was, please don't read too much into this. As mentioned publicly, Tesla is constrained, constrained by chip supply short term and cell supply long term. Not possible to produce additional vehicles in volume until both constraints are addressed. So if I had to guess here, Tesla is partnering with Pepsi to get the Tesla semis out there on the road and start testing them in a more realistic way. That would be my guess as to what's going on here. Not so much that Pepsi will be taking delivery of the first production Tesla semis, they're probably production-ish. And as they test these new semis with Pepsi, they're gonna come back to the drawing board and they'll make small improvements. And then eventually once the chip supply constraint is done and the, the cell supply constraint has been corrected, then they'll start producing these at scale. That's my guess of what's going on here. Here's some good news. All versions of the Model 3 and Y are now equipped with heating steering wheels and heated rear seats, which will make my children thrilled if we ever get a Model 3 or a Model Y, which is unlikely because they just raised the price of the Model Y again by $1,000. Like this car is so out of my price range at this point, like so out of my price range. Let's talk about the Model Y standard range, which is only sold in China. Well, kinda, it's sold out in China until 2022. I would really love it if Tesla decided to bring back the Model Y standard range. They'll probably call it like the Model Y rear wheel drive if they brought that back to the US because they had it out for a little bit and then they took it away and maybe a handful of people were able to order and actually get deliveries of this vehicle. So right now the Model Y long range is sold out until uh, 
June of 2022, and the Model Y Performance is sold out until January of 2022. So pretty crazy. And I went to Tesla's website. I read this from an article. I went to Tesla's website to try to confirm these numbers, and they just didn't even have the estimated delivery dates up there. So this is, you know, without a doubt, great for Tesla and not so great for people who want to buy a Tesla for sure. While we're on the topic of Tesla China, that 0% flexible leasing program or buying program that we talked about a few, I think it was on last week's show, actually. If you missed it, Tesla had this super flexible lease to get people into Tesla's as little as zero down. The, pan, the plan was so popular that Tesla has halted the program because they were inundated with orders. It was just too popular. So they have tweaked it a little bit. The plan remains much the same, but they've removed the 0% down option and you now have to put at least 10% down. Still not too bad. The Model X upgrade has more powerful motors and a higher energy density battery, according to EPA documents. And one more bit of news on this, the newer Model S and X have improved thermal efficiency when it comes to the battery pack and battery cells. So that's pretty cool. Tesla is starting to retrofit older Autopilot 2.0 vehicles with updated hard hardware to make them current with new Tesla models. This is only for the Model S and Model X. So if you got an early Model 3 um, and you still have hardware too, you're not getting upgraded at this time. However, if you purchased full self-driving when you purchased your Model 3, you should already have hardware 3. So. Having said that, uh, this is a free upgrade for people who ordered FSD at the time that they ordered their Teslas and they still own them. If you sold your car, you're kind of out of luck on this, but um, Tesla's already updated the actual hardware from hardware two to hardware three in most of these vehicles. This most recent update is a camera upgrade. So I'm gonna give Tesla some kudos here because they didn't have to do this, but they did it because it was the right thing to do. And I, I am, I'm very glad that Tesla is doing this and I'm very glad that they're providing excellent customer service to those folks who decided to, uh, you know, jump out there and, and buy a Model S or a Model X with this, you know, five or $6,000 option at the time. And then they just never got what they were promised. So this is awesome. So good for you, Tesla. Thank you for doing that. Our next story is interesting and I'm going to rely a lot on the folks in the audience who a own a Tesla and B are part of this FSD beta program. So here's how it goes. A model Y owner has the FSD beta and he claims that he was involved in an accident while FSD beta was active. So the same owner has filed a complaint with the national highway transportation safety administration, which makes this article even more fascinating for two reasons. One, this is, this would be the first FSD beta accident uh, that we know of. And two, they filed it with the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. So if they decide to investigate it, we're going to get to hear, you know, what they found in their investigation, which if they do investigate it, then we're going to get some nice follow up on this article and I'll keep my eyes open. But here is a little snippet of the complaint with the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. This is what the owner is uh alleging happened when the vehicle was in FSD beta mode. Here we go. The vehicle was in FSD beta mode and while taking a left, the cart went into the wrong lane and I was hit by another driver in the lane next to mine. The car gave an alert halfway through the turn. So I tried to turn the wheel to avoid it from going into the wrong lane, but the car itself took control and forced itself into the incorrect lane creating an unsafe maneuver, putting everyone involved at risk. The car is severely damaged on the driver's side. So, I, and I, I've had to re-record this several times, so be, <laughs> forgive me here if I've repeated some of these things. But as a non-Tesla owner, like I'm a non-Tesla, non-autonomous feature, non-EV owner who does a podcast about EVs and Tesla and autonomous driving, I really need my friends who are listening to this podcast to tell me, does this ring true to you? Because in my experience, if you give the steering wheel a little, just a little tug, it disables autopilot or FSD. So I'm not saying this person is lying. I just don't know. I don't have enough information from myself if this sounds true or not. So if you are 
I know one of you listening is a FSD beta member, but anybody else out there, if you're an FSD beta member, or if you just have FSD just in general, and this doesn't sound right, or if it does sound right to you, could you please let me know? Bodhi, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. I'd appreciate that. And finally, a little update here. Uh, remember a couple of weeks ago when I was very tired, very stressed, and maybe not entirely partial when I talked about a story about uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration trying to bully Tesla into releasing updates as like safety updates as um, recalls. And my take on this at the time was that it was completely unnecessary for Tesla to release these safety updates as recalls because that's a fundamental misunderstanding of how Tesla's over-the-air updates work. And I think it was like the next episode I talked about how sev several listeners had emailed in and kind of corrected me on this. And Tom Cooper also weighed in on this. And if you don't remember Tom, he is a retired lawyer and a Model Y owner. He was on episode 258 and we talked about NHTSA and their investigation into Tesla. And Tom wrote me a really nice note and he gave me permission to share it. Uh, he wrote me a, t a note on two different topics. So let's start off with the NHTSA note here. Let me pull that up. And I should mention that I'm just going to read the summary. Tom gave me a really good example. He laid a whole thing out about a company that makes widgets and they know that their widgets are causing accidents and they have ways that they could implement a better design product. And he, he laid it out really nicely, but his summary is really the point that I want everybody to hear. So let's go ahead and jump into that. It is reasonable for NHTSA, having learned about Tesla's new software design, to inquire into why it was not implemented earlier, and whether the cars were unreasonably dangerous because they did not incorporate that design earlier. And I'm going to stop reading for a second, and I'm just going to say Tom's opinion that it is completely reasonable for NHTSA to ask this. So I'm going on here, now I'm reading. We don't know what NHTSA will conclude, but it's a good thing that NHTSA is making this inquiry. It seems very likely that the attention NHTSA has focused on the problem of collisions with parked emergency vehicles has spurred Tesla to implement a solution. Hooray for us Tesla owners, our cars will be safer as a result. And Tom even added a little cool little Ronald Reagan quote with a little twist. He said to correct Ronald Reagan, in this case, government isn't the problem, government is the solution. Which if you're not familiar with the original quote, Ronald Reagan said at an inauguration that government wasn't the solution, government wasn't the problem. But I think Tom did a really great job of turning that original quote on its head and pointing out that government does do good things for the people. <laughs> I know. If you, if you watch TV and you read, you know, websites and Twitter and such, sometimes you don't get that. But uh, in this case, Tom is dead on. Now, let's get to the second note that Tom sent. And I think these two topics were maybe even in the same show. But I mentioned that the Tesla community was freaking out because Mary Missy Cummings was up for a position as a special advisor for safety at the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. And I can't remember exactly what I said, but what I felt, and I can tell you how I felt at the time when I read the story, was that the Biden administration was kind of stacking the deck against Tesla. And boy, do I regret having that take um, before looking into all of the details. Normally, I am very level-headed. Normally, I am very uh, even-keeled, and I don't get excited one way or the other about things. But uh Yeah. These stories really got me, so I need to take a moment and mea culpa here, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, Mary Cummings just isn't some random person off the street. She is a former U.S. Navy fighter pilot, so she clearly has uh, experience with, you know, real autopilot. She's also a professor at Duke University, where she oversees the school, school's human and anatomy laboratory and robotics program. So yeah, she's Dr. Mary Cummings, not just Mary Missy Cummings. What I'm trying to say here is she's a very educated person. And I only mentioned a few of her qualifications. She has much more than what I mentioned. So 
Uh, what Tom wanted to remind me of, and I think this is a great point, and I'm going to do a little bit of paraphrasing here, but it's basically when a qualified person opines about a subject that they have studied and that they are an expert in, that is not bias. This is precisely the kind of opinion that we need to seek out and value. I want to thank Tom for writing in. I think it added a tremendous amount of value to the show. So once again, I want to thank Tom and everybody else who emailed in on this topic because honestly, I think it makes the podcast better. I love getting pushback. I'm not a person that it needs. I don't need sycophants to listen to this podcast. I actually need people who are intelligent and can give me constructive feedback so that we can make the show better. All right, everybody, that is it for me today. If you want to email me again, it's Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. You can find me at 918digital on Twitter couple real quick notes. We have, let's see, next week will be the Lucid Motors earnings call. And the week after that is Thanksgiving here in the United States. So we have a Thanksgiving special that I think you're all going to enjoy. I'm really looking forward to recording it. And yeah, that's it for me. I hope everyone has a great week and I will talk to you next Friday.